Hi everyone. Welcome to the live seminar with uh, Wiebe Wagemans and Eva Schram, uh, live from San Francisco. And um, today what we will do, we will talk about doing business in the United States. So some of you already were on the uh, GSP program uh, talking about leadership. Uh, so what I would like to do is give you a small introduction. So basically bringing those companies, scale up companies to this program. And of course, welcoming everyone that's uh, live in this, uh, this session. So um, before we get started, people who don't know me, my name is Marianne van der Steen, professor of regenerative medicine at the University of Maastricht, part-time faculty at the University of California, Irvine, um, heavily involved in many startups, scale-ups, and um, in seed, in particular free seed uh, funds. So where my area is really, um, I would say Southern California, LA to San Diego and some of the South Midwest. Um, Wiebe and Eva are from uh, located in uh, San Francisco and um, Silicon Valley is of course for us the big dream. Uh, everyone who's scaling up is interested in Silicon Valley. Now, there are a lot of scale-up companies in uh, this uh, program. And a lot of these scale-up companies uh, are, of course, in the health field and are looking at either San Francisco, Southern California, or maybe even Boston to scale up the company. So um, we have two people here who really know how to do business in the United States. And uh, Wiebe Wagemans, I will give a short introduction. Wiebe and Eva are the writers uh, of a very, very interesting book about Silicon Valley. And Wiebe, for the people who don't know him, is of, our, is of course our serial entrepreneur from the Netherlands. We're very proud of him. Um, Wiebe uh, has a, a, yeah, built up many, many companies. He made... Uh, uh, a very successful uh, business into Nokia, worked in several uh, countries all around the world, building up uh, brands, businesses, startup companies, but um, has landed, as I can say, and feels very much at home in Silicon Valley. And he will tell you more about it during our conversation. Now, Eva is uh, also a, a famous person. Maybe you don't know her from her face. But she is uh, a journalist uh, for Financieel Dagblad and uh, for Knak BE. So uh, also from our neighbor countries, uh, uh, from, from Belgium, uh, writing about anything about tech companies, uh, the culture of Silicon Valley. So you can imagine that Wiebe and uh, Eva together wrote down a very, very interesting book that we will discuss today. So the audience today are, like I said, companies who are scaling up and want to enter the U.S. market. And something we see a lot is that um, we feel that the U.S. is the same as the Netherlands. We know it. We visited it. People were nice. People said that we had great propositions when we visited. But what is it to do business in the United States. What is the business culture and how does it work? So um, as a start, we are uh, basically doing a fireside chat or however you want to say it. But what I understand is that everyone has the opportunity to ask questions. So I like it to be very interactive. So it's a fireside chat um, with Wiebe and Eva. Uh, but in the meantime, really, really send your questions and maybe Gretje, you can say how everyone can um, share their questions, how it's going to work. 
Yeah, it's good good evening or good morning because I know there are people from around the US and Europe uh, attending. Uh, please write your questions. I've heard that it come through to the live stream we're in. So I will uh, forward your questions to, the, to um, the persons who are talking. It would be nice if you react on what is being said so that we can interact really like Moyanda said on the topic during the conversation. So I will ask your question. So don't be shy, ask them. It's also part of the American uh, American way of doing things. Ask your questions. If you don't ask it, you don't know what you what you what you what you're gonna receive. So please um, uh, join us in the conversation. Thank yes. you, Maria. And Kreetje, you you break in if there are questions. Yes, because absolutely. That makes it alive and okay. very nice. Uh, all right. So let's go to Bieber first. What is in your idea? When you tell a little bit about yourself, your real essence and who you are or things that you're proud of that are related to the book, can you can you bring in something that you say, oh, that's really me or this is what I experienced or this is what I am. This is what I'm great at. And that's why Silicon Valley is my place. Yeah, surely. First of all, thank you very much uh, for having us, uh, Marianne, uh, Geetje and uh, Bianca. Um, I think the and, and I think the, the good thing about the book is it's there's a there's a very lively discussion uh, between Ava and I who have different viewpoints of Silicon Valley. I think that makes it very attractive as well. Um, and the uh, the book is written uh, as a paying it forward principle. Uh, so we we really would like to bridge the the knowledge gap that we we think exists, but uh, between ecosystems outside of Silicon Valley and and in between. Maybe a, a personal. Uh, story about how I got here um, and why I fell in love with the place. Um, I'd lived uh, in, in several places before, you know, very risk averse countries like like Sweden, uh, Finland, Japan. Um, you know, I grew up in the Netherlands. I, I first left in 92, uh, came back to uh, to Europe um, in the in the 90s, but then uh, then left for the US uh, and landed uh, with Nokia uh, in, in Mountain View. Before I had been to the valley, you know, on these on these tours, um, and I always found it exciting, um, but nothing really special. I thought it was fairly similar to New York, in Boston, Seattle, Austin, you name them. Um, but when I when I landed here, when I started living here, I really noticed that the whole networking network, networking culture in particular is totally different. And uh, there's two main reasons why I fell in love with this place. First, because of the concentration of talent which is extraordinary. I have never seen any city. I mean, some come close. You know, you have Singapore, Shanghai, maybe that come close, but Silicon Valley as a concentration of talent in on this planet for high tech, which is where I'm, uh, where I, where I work at is, is, is extraordinary. The second reason is the energy level of the people. I just love that. Some people think it's too much of a pressure cooker, um, but I, I thrive. I need that, uh, that level uh, and, and it inspires me. Uh, that's that's it in a in a nut, in a nutshell, and uh, I can uh, ha hand over to Ava perhaps for, for for some more anecdotes. Yeah, but maybe I can ask one question in between sure. because there's a really good, um, I think, a cliffhanger to everything you've done because you love the energy level, you like to do many things. You are an exceptional serial entrepreneur, and. Can you can you tell to the to the audience a little bit more about yourself, of the companies that you're involved with, what you've done? Because that might be a nice link to what your passion is and what what you really like uh, yep. about Silicon Valley. I if I if I go back all the way, um, it's actually two generations of entrepreneurs in the Netherlands that I uh, I, I come from. Um, which you know, if you grow up with it, it, it changes you. Um, entrepreneurship was not taken very seriously in the Netherlands uh, until recently, as you know, after I left at least. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's on one. You know, I, I think that the level of jealousy, the level of of disdain that you that you get in in, in Netherlands and also other countries in Europe is is less now than it was a few decades ago. But it's definitely much less uh, here in the valley. Um, but I, that spirit of of building stuff that that what is what I grew up with. And um, then I, I still, after university, I, I still um, entered the, uh, you know, this was before software was scalable. So the, I still entered the mainstream, uh, you know, I started my career at, uh, at Gillette, which is now Procter & Gamble. 
Um, but the yeah, even even there, when I was at Nokia, I played a lot of uh, builder uh, roles, and and in the startup space, and even early stage, even though I ran a billion dollar business, um, whether you this the, the you know detract a few uh, zeros, it still is a very appealing to me when when the market is big enough, the opportunity is big enough. Nice, very nice. Eva, can you say what 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 attracts you, and how long have you been there in, in Silicon Valley? Is it? Uh, I came here almost five years ago, uh, and I wanted for me the so I'm a reporter, right? I'm not an well, I'm an entrepreneur in the sense that I'm a um, ZZ payer, um, so a, a sole proprietor. But um, I came, I wanted to move to the states and be a U.S. correspondent for a while. I decided. Um, and I saw opportunities on the West Coast. Most It's not that I had an innate passion for technology and innovation. I do now, I guess. But um, most Dutch journalists are on the East Coast. So I saw opportunity on the West Coast to really focus on Silicon Valley and the, and the area um, to report on. And, and I've been doing that for the past almost five years. Nice. And what, what, is, your, what is your passion? What did you find there? That you that attracts you and um, what is it personal for you? So I think it's there's always something happening here, and as a reporter, that's very exciting. There's always something to write about. Um, so whether it's the big companies that are launching new things or like I, for most of 2018, I wrote about you know Cambridge Analytica and all the privacy scandals that were happening here. So I, I kind of flow with the news too, but that's I think that's the main thing. There's always something happening here because it's everyone knows Facebook and Google and Amazon and all the big companies, but there's thousands and thousands of startups or scale-ups that are doing interesting things too. So, and then um, you know, the venture capital is is spreading out more over the states, but Silicon Valley is still the place for venture capital. So. Um, that's always interesting to keep an eye on too. That that's what attract. And then on a more personal level, California is just beautiful. So it's a great place. To, it's expensive. There's a lot of issues in California, but the, it's just a gorgeous place. So yeah. And I, it's interesting that you say that, Eva, because I think that makes it. Uh, you know, it's almost like I'm 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 working for the governor of California, but. The good thing is that a lot of people from Wall Street, when they made enough money, they come to California. So <laughs> I recognize it because I'm in Southern California that we have the, the biggest real estate people. We have the people who make most of the money and go and reside, you know, um, in, in, in my case, in Newport Beach. And they play golf on Pelican Hill. And that's where they join and talk about new investment in a very informal way, which is very different again, of course, in San Francisco, which is more formal VC environment, but it makes it interesting. It is an attractive place, I think. It is, yes. And I know even one of our companies that were helping Gretje um, at the moment coming to the United States, I, I know somebody really liked play, uh, you know, surfing. So she said, you know, I, I have great opportunities here and I can, you know, surf. So that, that plays a role, of course. It's an amazing place with amazing people. And if we go to your book, first of all, I would like to talk about a couple of exceptional people who became big in Silicon Valley and people you know. And, you know, you, you wrote some lessons uh, for uh, basically scale up companies who would like to come to uh to uh, the, the West Coast. And you mentioned uh, Elon Musk, of course, um, and his principles and how things work and how he sees uh, the world, uh, his passion, but also how he sees how he should do business. So before we really talk about the business culture, it might be interesting to talk about a couple of famous people that you know, and also bring in your own experience, especially you Viva, with being an entrepreneur. But can you tell a little bit more about Elon Musk, about this idea of putting your principles first? What, how, how does it work for the scale up CEOs who are in the in the program? Yes, I, I, I can start it. Maybe um, Ava can shed some light in as well. The um, the what uh, what Elon is not uh, 
very well known of, of is, is uh, first principles uh, reasoning. And obviously he's a smart guy and there's a lot of smart guys here and girls, uh, but the, um, what, what he does extremely well is, is question everything. It's almost in a sense, Dutch like, uh, like to question a lot, uh, but the, he goes down to what is in philosophy and, and physics is called first principle, uh, up initio. And that means that you, you go to a lower level of assumptions. So it's, uh, and, and in a business sense, that's usually is really, really hard to do because you, you have a lack of data. Um, but he goes down, you know, and especially after he exited uh, with his first startup that he uh, he sold. It was actually his second that that gave him more uh, more cloud to uh, you know build the companies that he's built today. Uh, he sold that to PayPal, and and what you saw the reasoning in in when he entered the the rocket industry um, was uh, when he, when he entered the battery industry with the the, the cars, the electric cars. Same thing. Um, he was not not just calling up suppliers. He was saying, okay. If I have to pay these guys, um, what have you, fifteen hundred dollars for a battery, um, and these components of these batteries are trading for thirty dollars, why am I paying fifteen hundred? So let, let's let's make it uh, ourselves. So fundamentally, he changed not not just the shape of of self driving and electric and, and and batteries. He he fundamentally changed even the layout of factories and 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 the 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 so innovation goes not just on a product level but on a design level on um, um uh yeah on 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 many levels in in that sense uh, including process yeah. i kind of visualize it as as uh, like peeling back an onion right so you start off with this with one onion and you're like what's what's underneath the first layer what's underneath the second and you keep going until you hit the core and then you know okay that's my fundamental principle and then i start building stuff back onto it so that's that's kind of his uh reasoning Always question why until you have the fundamentals. That's really, really interesting because this is also more the type of reasoning of VCs in the United States. And mm -hmm. to give you a very recent uh, question, I'm involved with a, with a, with a company uh, that's raising money uh, both in the Netherlands, Europe. We have some really large uh, life sciences investors. We have we have we're lucky in the Netherlands from that sense, being such a small country. But they co and you compare it to the questions and the perspective of VCs in the United States. It's it's huge, and in a way, it's the same what you're saying about Elon Musk. Go back to the principles, because. They start out with looking at, you know, the industry paradigm shifts and the company. Can you can you emphasize a little bit more on that? Because I'm I'm sure Weber Weber definitely raised money in, in many different places, but that's at the same time a lesson maybe how more at a deeper level. And I liked what Eva was saying at the if you peel it off. What is a VC about? Because that's that's also different. Like Elon Musk. Can you can you share some of your experiences there? Yeah, um, when I first came to the Valley, um, I uh, worked br briefly with uh, uh, Sequoia, for example, on Sandhill Road, and the uh, yeah, the networking is just on a, on a different planet. So the it's it's not just hey, we're going to write you a check for some uh, for some funding. That the whole uh, access to the absolute world experts in any field they're they're one or two phone calls away which which makes it uh totally different um so instead of sitting on an island i i always uh you know find it uh very similar to um asian cultures but on the other hand the it's it's less it's much less formal i don't you know in japan if i make an introduction i i need a double opt-in uh very few people are on platforms like linkedin it's super, super, uh, you know, if it, it, and the process takes a few days. Um, when I was at Angry Birds, I remember I had to build an analytics platform. Um, so they, uh, so I was talking to, uh, to our, uh, our investor at Excel Ventures, uh, which is uh, a big player here on, on, in Palo Alto, a big VC. And I, I asked, like, you know, do you have any advice? And they said, well, we have in our portfolio, we have a company called uh, Cloudera, which was at the time one of the uh, uh, the uh, yeah the, the, the highest uh, uh, profiled startups. And 
I think within three or four hours, we uh, we were sitting for coffee with the CTO after after two phone calls. So that that level of speed, that level of energy, and access to whoever it whatever it takes. There's uh, don't take no for an answer. It it's it makes it really it makes it really exciting. That doesn't happen every day, but it certain it certainly happens. I have a question. I think it it's to do with VC, so I think it's the right moment from a Nasdaq Biotech. Tanner Cameron, uh, he said, "Is uh, has the fundraising taken a hit uh, in the board due to the pandemic? Is there any uh, on that?" No. Yeah. So the first six months, it kind of looked like there was going to be less investments overall uh, in 2020, and I haven't seen like so. I I saw the last numbers in like October or November. Uh, but by then, it was pretty much on track with previous years, um, even first-time investments. So for a while, it was harder for early-stage startups that were not getting that were going for the first round to get investment. But even that kind of um, came came back around by the end of the year. You do one thing uh, that the data has shown is that um, so uh, investments in, in uh, women-owned companies and, and minority-owned companies was picking up over the last few years, and that kind of took a hit. So uh, diversity in, in fundraising has taken a bit of a hit during the pandemic, but overall fundraising is on track with previous years. Right. So now I have a question. I, I go on with a question because it's to, also to do with money, but on the other side of the money, it's from the honorary consul of San Diego, Hank Hanselaar. He asked, has Silicon Valley peaked? Too expensive, distance working, competition from other cities? Eva Wiebe? I, I can start. Um, this is, uh, the headlines obviously say that there's an exodus and everybody's leaving uh, Silicon Valley. Um, what's, what, are, what the data says, which we, we you know, uh, we look at clearly, we, we'd have a deep dive in our book of, of where are the market shares, not just of the, the VC funding rounds, but also of the exits. And it, what we show is in the last 10 years, Silicon Valley is more powerful and more concentrated than ever before. Um, as Ava said, it hasn't slowed down. Um, there's a couple of uh, folks that are leaving, mostly to Texas. And the reason is not because they're sick of Silicon Valley usually, it's, uh, it's mostly because the, the, the Texas are much more friendly on a personal uh, and on a, on a business level in, in places like Texas, which don't have state tax like, uh, like California. So I think it's a lot overblown, the whole story. Is there going to be an effect on, on uh, uh, remote working? Absolutely. Um, is it going to um, you know, lower some of the rents longer term uh, in, 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 the, in the valley in San Francisco? Hopefully, because the rents are absolutely outrageous. Uh, so they could take a little bit of a hit to give not just young, young entrepreneurs and young starters uh, a chance, because um, it's, it's almost impossible if you're, if you're a starter here. Uh, there's no, none, it's almost impossible even to rent a, a one uh, a one bedroom apartment. Um, so the, uh, in that sense, it it doesn't uh, harm the place when it, uh, work is done a little bit more remotely. But what we're seeing is, and that's the the counter side, is that even though the concentration of of talent and 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 power uh, and and also exit uh, uh, is is going to remain. The, there's going to be more opportunities over Zoom, right, uh, to, to connect with Silicon Valley. And that's one of the lessons uh, in our book. As Professor, I think it's Duckworth from uh, Berkeley, she said that she's been studying uh, Silicon Valley and the, the geographic effects uh, on other regions uh, who have tried something similar. And the, the number one lesson is wherever you are in the world, the key is how well connected to Silicon Valley are you? Because that's where the uh, you know they all the mistakes have been made, and and this is where uh, it moves uh, moves quickest. That's a very interesting point that you're making, and I understand also uh, Hank Hanselaar, who is uh, really the honorary consul of San Diego and very well connected to San Diego. And what we've seen in San Diego, I, I don't think Hank can talk, so I'll talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> that La Jolla has become the you know, especially for regenerative medicine, precision medicine, they build up this very fine, nice network uh, of, of great companies, corporate startups and so forth. And it's a smaller network, like you were saying, that it's easy to connect to, to, to people. 
and it's very focused and people know each other. So sometimes it, it depends if you're tech. Yes, you have to be in Silicon Valley, San Francisco. If it's more another area, sometimes you can be at another spot in California where you know, there is a lot of uh, an ecosystem that really fits your company. But then again, to connect to what you are saying, Rebe, and I really liked it, how well are you connected to Silicon Valley? Again, even if you're a med tech company like Irvine, Orange County is really the medical device, Mecca, San Diego, probably more in, in, in the biotech. Silicon Valley has a bit of everything, but especially tech. But again, it's the connection with the VCs, for instance, in Silicon Valley again. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it is, um, you know, a central factor in the world uh, for everything. So um, if we move to, to, to a next question, eh, because your book is so full of, of lessons, so it, it, it's sometimes hard to think where do we start. But if we go back to your um, your story, Bibi, you said, oh, well, you know, it was easy. And in a few hours, I was able to get to an investor, for instance. And I can imagine it's the same for a startup getting to speak to a corporate potential partner and so forth. What did they like about your company? And the question a little bit broader, what are they looking for in Silicon Valley? in the sense of, again, of the audience of startup companies who are thinking about moving to the US market. What is it? What attracts? What is in the business culture of Silicon Valley? What investors and the network, the ecosystem really, really likes? And why maybe you so easily got connected to this investor? Can you give us some tips or some yeah, surely. Um, I've founded uh, a couple of companies myself. Uh, some of them, uh, I hit a brick wall, uh, so it didn't go so well. Those were uh, not fun experiences, not even to look back on, but they're very educative. So we did decide to include them uh, in, in, in the book. Um, yeah, I, I had, a, had a really tough time raising uh, money for my uh, first startup, uh, which was in the, uh, in the field of, uh, this was uh, in the early days of uh, roaming. I was paying $1,800 a month on uh, voice and data roaming uh, internationally uh, on my mobile. And uh, this was before the EU even uh, had, had you know, put the caps in place on, on, the, uh, uh, on those services uh, into a market. And we had a software solution. I thought it was a beautiful solution. Um, at the time, it was, uh, uh, the market was, was, was large. It was not as large as it is today, obviously. But there were a lot of people like me, maybe not eighteen hundred dollars a month, but you know they might have a foreign trip and then would spend, you know, three hundred dollars or euros in, instead of uh, uh, five dollars, which would have been more acceptable to them. Um, so we had a solution, and and then uh, it turned out that this was in Silicon Valley in the early days. We were we were too early, uh, so the market didn't take off until the uh, the app stores kicked in. And, and people really had easy access to, uh, to those type of apps, and it was more prevalent. Uh, US was in that sense. I was very wrong about my timing um, because I, I thought that it was about time Silicon Valley would take over mobile, and this was uh, 06, 07. So they were already five years behind Europe and about seven years behind uh, Japan. Uh, but it wasn't the case. So uh, I went flat on my face with that one. I couldn't, couldn't raise uh, enough funds. And there were very few VCs who understood mobile at the time, maybe two or three in the whole bloody valley. That was, that was painful. Um, now, nowadays, um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's important to find the right player, right? So every, you have to realize um, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm an angel investor myself. You know, I, I, I'm, I don't do that full time. But there's the, the, the full time angel investors, the full time seed and, and, and VCs, they, they have a deal flow. They, they might see a, a thousand, uh, 1500 startups uh, a year. And, and you have to realize most of them don't, don't invest in more than five. So it's a crapshoot, you would think. So the, it, it all sits in the preparation. Uh, getting the right intro is is uh, is just a starting point, um, and sometimes you have to be careful, even with the introductions, that you don't burn yourself, right? If you're proper, I'll give you an example. If you're 
asking you know one of your connections to invite you uh, to introduce you to an investor in uh, in 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 silicon valley and the uh it's a it's a partner level so the time is precious um and you haven't done your proper homework you're you're obviously not going to get invested but guess what because of the strong networking culture here in the valley you're also burning the relationship between that vc or that angel investor and uh, the person who introduced uh, who made the introduction so the next time that that person who could be you know a very well known person um, who introduces not a startup let's say from the Netherlands uh, or Sweden or Singapore it doesn't matter that that will be taken less seriously so you might not be talking to partner level next time you might not get the same amount of time they might tune out after two after two slides uh, so you have to be really careful about that process and that's kind of you 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 mentioned um, San Francisco is a little bit more formal. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. It has this tendency that it looks super informal on the surface, but yeah, you're very you're very right. Behind the scenes, there is a hierarchy that we also describe in the book. Yes. And, um, and I have a question, which is really nice. Because I'm going to read it because it's also a nice comment for you both, Vibe and Eva, of course. And this is from Niels Bosma. Uh, I've read your book with great pleasure. It was a great insight in the region where we all have heard so much about. One question, do you think we as European entrepreneurs still have space left to fill with our businesses or will the US dominate everywhere? For instance, Amazon and Google buying startups as soon as they get to the traction in the market. Uh, the uh, the answer is yes. I don't think um, innovation comes from an, uh, a country or a, or a continent. In innovation comes from an individual. And uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, if you're and I do think you need that connection to Silicon Valley, uh, even if you're in in San Diego. And I, I've been to uh, La Jolla. I've been to uh, Carlsbad, and I, I have a little bit of an understanding of what goes on in, in small ecosystems around the world. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's crucial that you. Uh, uh, you build that connection. You can come up with an idea anywhere in the world. Uh, it, it requires grit. You know, you have to be a, a bit of a stubborn uh, personality. Otherwise, you, you know, uh, because otherwise you're going to listen too much to other people and they'll tell you not to do it. <laughs> so that's that's key. Um, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, you, Europe, I, I mean, I, I worked for the last uh, technology giant from Europe, which was Nokia. And, and it's very unfortunate that... Uh, now, DeepMind is a great example. That's, I think, one of the last ones that came through um, over the last uh, 10 years that has really uh, had the chance to break through. It's almost, you know, it was almost impossible to thrive in, in an ecosystem in Europe, in the UK. You know, came I think it came out of uh, uh, Oxford or so. But the um, DeepMind was acquired by Google for about 400 million or so, way too little. But on the other hand, because it's so early stage, uh, it's almost like an R&D lab where there, there's this company is not going to is not going to break even anytime soon. So the question is then, from a European perspective, could how in what type of setup could it have been supported longer term? And and it would have almost been impossible uh, without a player like Google with extremely deep pockets that is willing to throw you know half a billion dollar at, uh, at them uh, every year. Uh, they still have to report to Mountain View. Uh, but there's tremendous uh, uh, advancements in AI and in, in deep learning and, and, and recursive and you, you name it. There's there's a lot of uh, stuff coming out of that uh, that team in, in London. Um, so it's not impossible. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the monopoly position uh, or oligopoly position of those big uh, cloud giants like Google is scary as it has very negative effects for innovation. Um, but it's hard to, to, to keep those startups like DeepMind in, in Europe. It's, it's really, really hard. Um, there's, I mean, there's, there's some companies that are still doing well. SAP is doing fine. Um, you have, uh, ASML is doing fine. Uh, yeah, the ecosystem, uh, I think that's, uh, that's what, what, uh, the learnings from, from Silicon Valley are still key wherever you are in the, in, in the world. But is there going to be ever going to be a next, um, Google level player coming out of Europe? Um, that's. It, it, it's very likely that they might spring up in Asia uh, or in Europe, but that they, they still will make the jump or get acquired uh, sooner rather than later. That's correct. Eva, do you want to add something to this? or Because 
Yeah, I well, I largely agree with uh, uh, Viva that um, the U.S. does not, or Silicon Valley does not have a patent on create creativity or innovation that can happen anywhere. But it's about the ecosystem, is is what Viva was saying. Um, part of that is venture capital. That I mean, I, uh, venture capital is growing in Europe, but we show in the book that it's still peanuts compared to the to U.S. and China. Um, and so if you have this great innovative startup with a great product that you're that, that has the potential to you know rule the world, you're more likely to get funding for that in, in, in the US or China than, than in Europe to, to have that kind of growth you need to get there. Um, and it's true that Google and Amazon are buying everything left and right, although they are scrutinized a bit more these days by the US federal government. So um, I've heard that they are, becoming a little bit more careful about buying companies because the authorities are looking at them. Um, but it's still pretty high. Um, so, so, yeah. So, yeah. so maybe, so, Eva, what, what you are saying is, and I recognize it, it, we all call it the valley of death, really, is that you probably, especially for these uh, companies with, with real technological uh, paradigm shifts, right? That need a lot of money, um, can only grow so much in Europe. And what we experience, and I'm looking at Gretje and Henk Hanslein, a lot of people who are always helping us to get those really potential great startups who can become scale-ups in the United States, they can hardly find enough money to grow into the US market because, you know, Dutch investors, well, they pick a couple of companies that they help and get to NASDAQ, of course. Um, but, but there's this potential group of potential great companies who can't find money uh, to really build up that company. Because one of the big differences um, that, that we experience, well, I can almost say on a daily basis, is the difference uh, between the US culture and the Dutch culture. And maybe you can emphasize a little bit more on that because I know a lot of CEOs uh, are, are experiencing that as a barrier. That on the one hand you see, uh, you need a lot of money, but that's more in a, a statement that uh, you can react to it. You need a lot of money to build up a good team in the US to scale up your company. And in general, uh, it's hard to find investments in Europe to, or Asia maybe as well, to build up to such a level. So how do you, do, do you also recognize it? Um, and the other point is maybe related to culture, that in the US, sometimes we experience a difference that we like the people, let's say consultants or a potential entrepreneur, and the Dutch think, the CEO thinks, oh, that's great. I'm going to work with that person. And that person will do a lot for me for, let's say, 10,000 for six months or whatever. And they are very disappointed if very little comes out of it. And the U.S. person thinks, oh, well, you know, they're so cheap, those Dutch. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that much for 10,000 for six months. So how do you experience that? The, the building up that team in the US and, and, and how to deal with that in, in a way different business culture? Yeah, $10,000 is, is not gonna get you very far in, in a place like Silicon Valley. Um, and then you put the, uh, uh, the, sting, uh, the stinginess on, on top of that. The, uh, I, I would say, I would, uh, I would answer, answer it more towards uh, uh, in, in equity, I think the answer lies in, in uh, building an advisory board and, and handing out shares to advisory board members. And especially with science heavy uh, startups, I would add next to a standard advisory board, I would add um, a scientific advisory board. Uh, the advisory board usually consists of folks, it could be an executive coach type of person who has built a startup to, to and scaled it up to a $100 million business, for example. Uh, somebody has been through it um, and, and, can, and can tell you, you know, these are your blind spots. You need to move them into weak spots because you are you you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and that happens a lot with uh, first time founders in particular. Um, the and, and be honest to them. Um, so the and then you uh, 
but those people, um, and you, you cannot count that much on ad hoc relationships. I'm a big fan of mentoring programs. Um, and they should be they should be there. And I've I've mentored myself. I, I can't even count anymore. Probably hundreds of startups, um, but those are one offs. Usually, those are not long term relationships. And in Silicon Valley, um, as you probably know, you know Google used to pay their rent in in shares. That, that those crazy days are, are gone. But uh, from the uh, late nineties, but uh, still, uh, shares are a currency. And what what European uh, startups usually don't get is that they have to hand out shares uh and it it's it really what it does is it it aligns the the objectives of the people involved you know all of a sudden an advisor that has stake has has skin in the game ha, is is his nose is his or her nose is pointing the same direction as the as the leadership team um so it's it's part of it is 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 um, equity part of it is cash uh, certainly helps, uh, but I could highly recommend building advisory or scientific advisory boards uh, in uh, in the valley. It uh, doesn't have to be all in the valley. You know, it could be if if you have a biotech uh, professor uh, at at MIT in Boston, fine. You know, go for it. Um, but that's that's what it takes, and uh, it's it's lagging. It's uh, uh, that understanding of you need to build that network longer term, and those mentoring programs that people rely on is. Yeah, I'm 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 going on a bus tour to Silicon Valley. I'm getting some intros, and and I'll take it from there. Yeah, that doesn't work. No, that is, that is a very interesting uh, comment that you make as well. I think you gave us some very deep advice already. You know, shares as a currency. I think this is a totally different mindset than than most companies. And I'm not just saying oh the CEOs lack a vision there but it's it's kind of the vcs who push you will also in a certain direction or limit your direction but that's that is a really really key one and having skin in the game is what you hear all the time in the us and in in your in europe yes skin in the game yes but not like in the us and but that changes the game like you were saying i really really like it and the idea what you're saying of networks should be longer term and like we did our um, uh, session in san francisco and you were there too we were in uh, what was it november in an empty san francisco it was interesting because <laughs> everyone's gone but that was interesting that's a first step hey listen this is my pitch maybe i find some interesting people wonderful as a first introduction but being an innovation tourist as we sometimes call those missions you know it's wonderful there's a mission here and a mission there are usually uh, not um, not resulting to anything other than maybe getting some inspiration because you you need people and that's basically what you're saying as well you need people on board who are going to be for, with you for longer term. And I think if we really think about it as Dutch, you know, being in the Netherlands, you, we are thinking the same in the end, right? Um, if you meet somebody once who comes from China, or whatever, you're like, okay, interesting, but there's no relation and you, you're not gonna invest your time in a way that's true. Eva, did you recognize because I, I, maybe you can tell us a bit more because I really, really was triggered by that one in your book, um, you know, make your blind spots into weaknesses because that isn't, you know, I've never seen somebody writing that. And I, I thought that was an intriguing, interesting one. So maybe Eva, you can say something about that as an advice um, related to this. Well, yeah, so that, that really ties into what Eva was just talking about that um, you the, the the very definition of a blind spot is that you don't see it. So you need someone else to point it out to you. And everyone has them. Everyone has their own blind spots. Um, and but they can if they're if you're blind to something that could potentially hurt your business, you need someone to point it out to you. And they might know they need they might need to say um, you don't. It could be a business thing like you, you're not focusing on this geography enough, but it could also be you're, you're not um, susceptible to uh, certain types of um, comments or you, you wave away like uh, certain comments that are made to you. You need to work on that. And there might al always be weaknesses. There might always be something that you're not great at, but at least you know you're not great at it and you can help have other people help you get better at it. 
or or take over. So that's 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 really what we're trying to say there. Um, and that and that the the people who can do that best point out those weaknesses or those blind spots to you uh, are people you might want to hire in an advisory board. So if someone says to you, "You're not a great people manager. You're great. You have a, a vision. You can do this and that, but you're not the best people manager." Then you can have someone else come and help you with that. But someone needs to point it out to you. So make a blind spot, something that you don't know about. Make it a weakness and ha get help getting better at it. That's the yeah. main lesson. And every, everyone needs it. Everyone has their own blind spots. So, yeah. That is, I, I really like it. And what we did in the session before this, this session was a leadership session. Basically, if you go from startup to scale up, hey, who are you as a leader? And, you know, your whole context is going to change. And that must be the same for, you know, a CEO coming to Silicon Valley in the context of the Netherlands, you're another person and another company than when you are in Silicon Valley. So uh, if you didn't have blind spots, you might have blind spots, if you understand what I mean, in the new context that you're not well, aware it, of. It's definitely true if you're if you're looking to expand in the US or if you're, you'll definitely need help because it is not, the US won, the US is a very big country, so you need some help picking your, your markets. Um, but the culture is also different. So you'll need help figuring out that culture and how to how how to act um yeah uh, and and you might be aware of that so it might not exactly be a blind spot but that's uh, one of the core le our book is called the secret of silicon valley there are more than one but one of them is that um the realization that you don't know everything you might know a lot but you need some help you do it together you never do it alone so you always ask right. for help if you need it Right, uh, so I have that, a, a very oh. practical question. I think that's uh, back to money. Um, and the question is very interesting. It's what fundraising tactics have been successfully employed by Dutch startups in the US during the pandemic? We we described one uh, Dutch startup in the book, but that, it was in January. So that's kind of just before the pandemic, but we featured it because it was interesting. It was actually two guys from Delft. Um, I'm blanking on their orchest is their the name of their startup, uh, and they were raising seed money. So they're very early stage, pre-seed or seed. I don't remember, but um, they got their connections in the valley through GitHub, uh, the platform where they were uh, just um, publishing their code and their projects. Uh, and then some VCs actually started emailing them like, "Hey, we're interested in what you're doing. You want to talk?" Um, so that's an interesting. They didn't like actively network or were actively trying to get people to, to that came later, but they were kind of discovered um, through GitHub. So that's an interesting uh, platform, I think, for especially if you're in high tech, then um, those kind of platforms or others are being looked at by VCs and angel investors. And then so they, they made a few acquaintances and then it came to the valley and those angels or people that uh, vouch for their idea, help to introduce them to other investors, and that kind of got the ball rolling. Again, that was just before the pandemic. I don't, I don't know of any very specific examples during the pandemic. I know both Message Bird and Molly actually got major investments during the pandemic, um, but I don't really know how they got to the. Like, I don't know their process too well. So, do you seen some examples, Vibe? What happened during the pandemic? Yeah, what something happen? <laughs> well, what what uh, Ava mentioned is that uh, you know the second half of 2020, uh, you know the, the amount of, of venture capital uh, also from the valley uh, poured in and, and exceeded all expectations uh, despite uh, despite of the Corona crisis, and that that tells you that uh, and and I guess most of the money has I have to be honest most of the money did go into existing portfolio companies. Um, but there were also uh, lots of companies, um, you know, back in the day, um, I remember the times when, when a VC on Sand Hill Road, uh, which is a street in, uh, in Menlo Park, very close to the Stanford campus, which is where most of the top VCs are located. Uh, I remember the days when they said, look, if, if you're not in driving distance uh, from Sand Hill Road, I'm not going to invest in you because we're going to have a monthly board meeting. So they, they need to be face to face. Well, guess what? There was nothing face to face. There hasn't been anything face to face in the last uh, what is it, ten months now? 
in the US. Uh, it's been much more severe than in most countries in Europe, uh, the, the closings and the and so forth. So uh, what what we do see, yes, the vast majority of the VC capital has gone has poured into existing uh, uh, companies, portfolio companies where there was already a personal relationship. But there have been plenty of companies where the VCs or seed or angels never got to meet the founders and, and still wired their money after meeting them over Zoom. So I think that, that that's a that's a great learning that this is actually opening up opportunities, uh, whether you're whether you're a startup out of Maastricht or uh, out of Seoul in South Korea. And uh, it's possible they will take those monthly board meetings now more and more over Zoom. And uh, this this opens up opportunities. Um, and by the way, you know, there's a, there's an idea that two, two points I wanted to make still about the, the venture funding. It wasn't only about Silicon Valley. A lot of the Silicon Valley money and the LPs that invest in those VCs actually has gone to China over the last five years. And um, so those, those are funds uh, very often managed from Silicon Valley or satellite offices in Beijing or Shanghai. So there's already a lot of money and influence of Silicon Valley abroad. That's number one. Number two, you don't have to have your whole team uh, in Silicon Valley. That's, that's also uh, a false assumption in many cases. That, you know, uh, offshoring and, and outsourcing has been going on for many, many years. Do you want to have the core team preferably in Silicon Valley? Yes, but most startups can't afford it anyway. And this is, this is I think, is, is accelerated. This effect has been accelerated uh, during this uh, crisis. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's also showing, it, 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 it's hopeful in a way, right? There's a, a sort of, I mean, for all these CEOs who can travel now, it, it, it's good to hear that, that things can happen um, under maybe certain circumstances, but that it is possible. And maybe it's opening up more opportunities for, uh, you know, European uh, companies to to. What I've seen from my uh, environment now is that um, there has been, uh, there is a shift in a way because all the VCs, most VCs in Europe are now investing in their own portfolio companies because, well, yeah, they're, they're especially in life sciences, a lot of uh, trials couldn't uh, continue. And so I see a lot of life sciences companies looking for alternatives much more than they've done before so i'm seeing at the moment a company that is raising money in the united states and europe because of this reason and successfully and so they start up headquarters in both uh, both continents um the same is true in in smaller amounts for for companies uh that 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 get innovation grants in completely different areas uh in, for instance in arizona and start up headquarters in arizona all at a sudden because they have no choice so sometimes you become more creative by something like a pandemic uh, and 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 maybe if we if we go in that direction, that was in the Financial Dagblad, uh, Eva, <laughs> and a very nice interview. Let me see. It was oh, it was Wednesday. It was actually yesterday, of the Moderna uh, CEO, and Nubar Afrayan, if I pronounce it right, and he said, I think many of you have read it, innovation is something for immigrants. And he's convinced, basically, you know, if, if I, it's a very good interview, but what he's basically saying, if you have no choice, if you come to a new country and you have nothing to lose, you can only go up, very American, you can only go up, so you go up and you do anything to, to become successful. What do you think about that in the context of your book? Because in one way or the other, it's connected to a lot of things you've been written. And what uh, what now uh, now now Boer is Bar is basically saying uh, in this interview. Well, so I haven't what read the think? interview just yet, but uh, we do in the book mention that Silicon Valley is is for a large part inhabited by immigrants. Um, I forgot the exact data, but something like fifty percent of startups have a founder that's like or unicorns um, have a founder that's. An immigrant, and then at least one immigrant in the in the um, management team of a, of startups, like eighty. That's eighty percent or something. Um, so it's high, and we go into it a little bit that just because, yeah, 
well, we're both in, immigrants too. Um, you're in a new country. It's not like for me, at least when I moved here, I, it's not like I, I was rock bottom and I could only go up. I had a very nice <laughs> place to go back to if something went wrong. That, that for me was part of the reason to even move here. Cause I knew if I fell flat on my face and everything went wrong then you know, I could always go home to Holland and, and, and find, <laughs> get back on track there. But there is this innate, um, desire. that's the whole reason to moving for moving to another country often. Anyway, it, it's, to make to build something from the ground up and to really make that succeed and i think most immigrants have that innate desire and there's actually i wrote about this years ago but there's a study that anyone even if you're not starting your own startup but you you join a company abroad that if you live abroad for even a few years it makes you more successful in your career later on even if you move back home even if you uh, it was just a few years and you worked at a company, you didn't start your own company. It's this just being in a different culture and learning to do it yourself from the ground up. That's, that's just a very valuable, um, uh, life trait or a character trait to get. So, yeah. Nice. Very nice. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, it is, uh, um, related to what Marion was taught, telling about European companies being, very um, innovative in the sense of that they, were, they are looking for different places to set up, a, set up a business. So the story about the BV in the Netherlands and then something at a, probably a Delaware company in the US at the same time. I know Wiebe that you told us some uh, in an earlier phase earlier, you told me about that you think that the Delaware company should be the head company or the holding company. Can you elaborate a bit more about how that works for you? Absolutely, yes. Um, so, where I would I would argue that wherever you are in the world, uh, set up your Delaware C corp first. And that sounds really weird. Why do I act in some obscure state that most people have never heard of? Why would I set up a company there? Um, simply because it's the de facto standard in Silicon Valley. There's no fu no company uh, getting funded in Silicon Valley uh, unless you're a C corp in Delaware. That's just the name of the game. Um, Let's let's take an example. Let's say I started, um, I, I started, uh, I founded a startup in Eindhoven, and I set up a, a BV in the Netherlands. Um, what happens is that with the BV, I won't be able to raise funds. Um, un at least until recently, it was almost impossible to raise funds in a BV un unless you're already way later stage and you're super successful. It's really really hard to raise funds in uh, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, with the C with the C corp in Delaware, uh, it's it's all of a sudden a lot easier. Even if the the team uh, is not uh, fully uh, fully uh, present in the valley, um, so it's it's legal, uh, it's financial. It gives you access to more capital because you, you'll get uh, bigger investments in in the U.S. than in Europe. That's uh, that's pretty clear. Um, the other the other part is the exits. When you're a BV, the likelihood that you're going to get an exit is much smaller. Um, because you've had access to that capital and, and a C Corp is much more uh, attractive to uh, American companies and they are still doing the vast majority of, of the, uh, the takeovers. Um, that gets me to the next point, which is a chapter in our book called Deadwood in, in uh, Dutch called Kreupelhout. Um, and this is one of the blind, I would say this is a typical blind spot of Dutch CEOs. They have no bloody clue what, what uh, uh, Deadwood on a cap table is. But 95%, in my opinion, not just Dutch, uh, you know, it could be German, Finnish, Singaporean. 95% of the companies have that wood on the cap table. What that means is that you have um, loaded yourself, not with debt, but you've got people on the cap table that are sitting there with way more equity than they should. Some folks, they give for a few hundred thousand euros or dollars or pounds or, or slotty. They give, uh, you know, they give ridiculous percentages of their companies away, and then the next investor, that, and, that, and then by the way, they have become successful and they go fundraising in, in, in New York or, or LA or, or Silicon Valley, and then they'll hear, well, you gave thirty percent away to this investor that put two hundred thousand dollars in. What the heck were you thinking? And and I can't turn that back. And then the what what happens is, the uh, employees get screwed over time. Um, and, and you want to have your employees uh, uh, motivated. Let me tell you that. In, in Silicon Valley, as I said, the currency is mostly, you know, with the cost of living so high, 
the upside is really only usually in the uh, in in the in the equity. So if you want to have the best employees in the world, at least in Silicon Valley, not in not in other places, but in Silicon Valley, you have to have if you want to compete with you know hiring uh, the hiring office of Google and and Facebook, you need you need to have really uh, big chunks of equity carved out, and that's uh, that, so that's that's just standard practice, and there's formulas for that, by the way. Um, what that means is that yeah, Delaware first, and then uh, limit your uh, dead wood on the cap table. And also, uh, what you also see a lot is um, what we call poisoned uh, poison term sheets uh, in in many places. They they have it's 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 much less the case than ten or twenty years ago. But you, you still see them, uh, especially in Europe, with and and it's it's actually you know it's it's it's, it's almost like a VC or a seed investor is shooting themselves in the foot because when they ask for these ridiculous terms and percentages, they don't realize that this company will never ever raise money anymore in the next round in Silicon Valley. So they're kind of limiting the exit already, and that was the the idea to, in the first place, so that they have a bigger chunks to, to exit. But they're actually limiting the exit opportunity. So it's. It's it's really unfortunate that the ecosystem of of seed and 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 VCs outside of the valley still have a lot of learning to do. I really appreciate what you're saying, Viva, because I completely recognize what you're saying, and it starts to go wrong even earlier because I think many university startups, which the the high tech startups and life sciences startups, spring from universities. And the policies are made by policy makers at the university level. So the administrators have think about risk, uh, you know, uh, the risk averse. They think about their risk and they don't think in the end, like what you are saying, well, maybe if we're very successful, we'll find a VC in Silicon Valley. So you almost have to do, I would almost call it uh, reverse engineering, start thinking how your term sheet and your share should look like once you become successful and what does it mean uh going back um i would almost say to the stakeholders from vcs to regional seed funds going back to term sheets you are making with university policy makers and that is a big issue and and we have seen and i i point really to Gretje because we we brought a lot of companies to the us who really got in trouble when we talked to investors? It was like, oh no, there we go again. And it's so sad because the technology is right and everything is right. So that is a very important point. Uh, you're, you're so right. this is another reason to have uh, an advisory board or people who can help you out with these kinds of things, right? To, yes. to not make those mistakes for later on. But but that would would that also be your uh, suggestion to bring in maybe advisors also from the U.S. at an early stage start up? Oh, ab Delaware absolutely! Oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, absolutely. And and to, especially like you said, the the critical mistakes are not being made at scale up phase, right? The the, the maneuverability you have at this what you call scale ups um, is 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 narrow. Um, the the vast the the focus in, in in territories like the Netherlands or or other smaller geographic areas that want to replicate an ecosystem has to be on early stage. That's where the mistakes are being made. So get get the experts on board. Um, I'm not an expert. You know, I, I always often give the example that if if Starbucks would be open here in Palo Alto um, and Ava and I would walk in, there would probably be three or four people that know ten times as much about startups as, as we do. But you know, when we when we visit places like the Netherlands, we we often feel like like one-eyed man in the land of the blind, and that's not uh, derogatory. It, it's really we we're trying to help, right? That was the whole purpose of the bloody book was hey, we we want to pay it forward. But you you need to realize that. Um, and by the way, when you when you set up your shop in Delaware, it doesn't mean you don't have a BV. It just means that the BV and which can still own the IP, so that you can still get the subsidies in a place like the Netherlands. But you place that underneath. As 100, so 100 percent owned by the Delaware company, so that's how you set it up legally. That's where it goes starts going wrong, and then uh, making sure that you get a clean cap table uh, from the get go. And yeah, it's 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 unfortunate that uh, it's 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 it's, it's uh, yeah, especially until recently, it was driven by a lot of amateurs that were basically canceling out uh, great ideas and great startup. And we'd like the opposite, right? We'd like those startups from 
from uh, those places to, to, to raise as much money from Silicon Valley as they can, because there's super smart people, well-educated in Europe, very, very driven, uh, great teams. So there's no reason why we, it couldn't, be, uh, couldn't get done. Right. So what, what is your comment then or advice, basically? Because you sketch out, you know, the strengths and maybe it's nice if you, if you go more in depth in that again of the pillars almost of Silicon Valley. You do that in a very, very structured and nice way. Um, if you compare to comments we get uh, in the Netherlands, on the one hand, everyone wants to build an ecosystem, startup ecosystem with impact. And then there is the other commands, but we don't want them to leave the Netherlands or the region, for instance, right? Because we invested in the company. How do you deal with that? And can you deal with it? And, and, and of course we can't compare the Netherlands completely to Silicon Valley, but yeah, how, how, how can we deal with it? Because that might be, um, well, a paradox, the most, if not a contradiction, um, saying we want to keep them. And on the other hand, being a very impactful startup ecosystem. How do you deal with that? As the Netherlands, do you have any advice? Well, it's, it's also that, oh, it's also that the ecosystem in the Netherlands is just very young, right? So it needs time to mature. And, and if some of the more successful companies now um exit or, or they make some money and they reinvest into the ecosystem it'll grow that takes time silicon valley wasn't built in in uh five years either um but um for wanting to keep them in the netherlands having a, having your i guess you're technically an american company if you have delaware if you're a delaware corporation but if you have your headquarters in the netherlands you're more or less still counted as a dutch company or at least i know by some of the dutch um players, they'll count you as a Dutch company. So I think the Delaware company, uh, just having that, that legal structure doesn't make you an American or it might technically, but it's not that you're completely leaving the Netherlands if you do, right? So I think that's one of it, one part of it. I have a question for you both from uh, Henk Hansler. Um He asks, and I think it's uh, also to do with um, well, culture and, and other things, things to be in the US, he says, can you elaborate about the critical role of a CEO, uh, her skills, his skills, prior experience, network and track record in fundraising? And if you compare that with the, the, the things we were talking about half uh, the last 10 minutes, like how it's done in the Netherlands, um, what, what are the additional features somebody needs probably? Yeah, I would I would go back to um, and we see a lot of first time CEOs. So it's it's not necessary to to have all those skills uh, because it, you know a lot of experience you learn along the way. Um, it it does help to uh, to start uh, by reading a lot. Um, you know, hopefully we we provide some lessons in the book uh, that can guide you. Uh, but it comes it comes down I would say to what Ava was saying earlier is, is about the blind spots. It's about the individual. The, uh, and their learn their learning curve. So, do they have the learning curve to move their blind spots to weak spots? If that's not the case, um, and and this is you know you all often ask, is is uh, what what is the weakest link in in a startup? A lot of people point out to hey, we need a product market fit or product feature fit, or uh, we need revenues, or we need to make sure that the team is gelled, gelling together and they've been working together, uh, hopefully for a few years already, so we know that they're going to stick together. I actually have a different view. I find in the startups, um, you know, I've been in now probably 30, 30, 40 startup uh, uh, boards and advisory boards over the last 15 years. And my experience is actually, if the founders cannot turn their blind spots to weak spots and, and don't show that learning curve, and are not receptive enough, that's a recipe for disaster. And I rarely, rarely see those startups getting out of that hole that they dug. And that's really unfortunate because you're talking very often about super smart people, about um, great ideas, great markets, sometimes even phenomenal revenues. But sooner or later, they're going to hit a wall uh, because they're not receptive to their uh, to their blind spots. And it could be 
Uh, it could be a scientific blind spot. It could be uh, their e uh, usually it's their ego setting it away, right? If they're not receptive. Uh, but um, it could be emotional intelligence. It could be um, not understanding the competitive landscape enough, uh, different business models. It could be different dimensions. It's very important to realize that when you're a CEO, you could be absolutely brilliant, like top 10 in the world in one or two dimensions. But you need to realize there's other dimensions. You're going to be below par and you need to have, you need, you need help. You really need help. And that's the, the secret of Silicon Valley is networking. Find those people that cover those blind spots and hopefully they turn into weak spots. Make sure you have a network that surrounds you both on your team and on the sidelines that, that compensate for that. And, and that's, that's really the key. Right. I've got an additional question. Um, the question is, besides your own book, are there other books you can recommend that um, CEOs can read? Yes. Um, one is, uh, I've actually, I uh, gave you the wrong name earlier. It's not uh, Professor Duckworth at, at Berkeley. It's actually uh, Professor Saxonon. And um, the, that's her, I forgot the name of her book, uh, but it's about eco, building ecosystems uh, outside of Silicon Valley. There's um, an other one, uh, I can't come up with a name. It's, um, so it's the guys that wrote the, um, the thing about the big hairy audacious goals, I forgot the title of the book, but um, we mentioned it in our book, which is, yeah. I think is a probably a good inspiring about setting grand goals that seem almost impossible to achieve, but um, can inspire the whole organization to, to work towards a common goal. And then Another you also one. mentioned a blog post in the book, uh, uh, Viva, uh, by Jack Welch. Yeah, you have everyone yeah. Read. Jack Welch is, is uh, talking about the, um, what he calls the bigger, the bigger secret in, in business, um, uh, candor. Um, candor is, is often lacking. Uh, the Dutch are actually very good at it, <laughs> but sometimes, <laughs> too blunt, too, sometimes too bluntly. Um, it has to be done in a, uh, you know, in, in a balanced way. Uh, but it can be super effective. So, um, Candor, it's an, um, I think it's an article or a, a blog post from uh, Jack Welch. Uh, that's, that's a really good one. Another book I always recommend uh, startups is when they start pitching, you know, and especially while you're fundraising, which is a three to six months process, usually multiple times during your journey. Uh, it's almost a full time job for a CEO. You know, that journey, uh, I always uh, call out the, the book from, uh, written by Chris Lipp. He's a lecturer at Stanford uh, Business School. Uh, it's uh, it's a book about. It's called uh, the, the Startup Pitch, and Lip is L I P P. Uh, that's a that's a brilliant book. Uh, what he did, he reverse engineered the pitching process. He looked at the startups that raised the most amount of money, and then looked at the commonalities uh, of their structure in their pitch. So the, the, it's 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 absolutely brilliant. Um, the way he sets up the pitch structure. And, and clearly lays it out what you need to do and how um, I think is is absolutely brilliant. And I've seen a lot of startups benefit from from uh, from his structure. Um, and go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Rebe. No, no. I, I had two suggestions, but you you're you're in a good brainwave. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there's. Uh, I think reading. Uh, there's a lot of great medium posts uh, nowadays um, in in the valley. The, uh, it it's, depends on. You know, one, one in particular a field that I think hasn't really broken through in the scientific world, even in the business world, whether you go to Stanford Business School or even uh, Harvard Business School, you, you don't see what, which, what we call is, uh, is, is uh, growth strategy, so growth hacking. Um, the networking effect uh, is, is I, I'd love to see some more academic study on this. Um, when you look at um, clustering coefficient, um, and then why is this important? Like this is coming out of graph theory, out of math. Like why am I bringing this up? Because this is how, how Zoom uh, spread through the valley. This is how Slack uh, got uh, adoption. So distribution, what a lot of companies, especially startups out of the universities don't understand is when they, when they filed their patents, when they written their academic papers, that's just the start of the journey. The distribution is the hardest that they still need to accomplish, especially in places like the US. Now, very interesting. This is maybe not as as uh, replicable to uh, you know a medical startup uh, or a biotech, uh, but the example of Zoom and and Slack are phenomenal because they spread through uh, clusters. 
and not just um, so it was a network effect that was built into the product and on top of that they increased the k factor the k factor is very very uh, uh, comparable to the uh, r0 factor in uh, corona so mm -hmm. so you so instead of managing a saas model and a spreadsheet you're actually managing that factor and that changes the whole game the whole game for for how you set up your your structure and your strategy for your organization so there's a lot going on even in in business processes and, and how startups uh, run businesses that, that, you know, both startups and, and corporates in, in, in Europe or Asia have never heard, uh, heard of even. So I, I really I, admire that. Weber, I, I really like that comment what you're saying because it also applies for life sciences startups, but you would work with it more with KOL type of strategy. Where do you start trials, parallel data building? because of the different health systems in the US, you can make choices there, right? And, and manage it. I, I'm really aspire, inspired by that because it will work in life sciences, but we have a tendency to take it so step by step and letting us be led by the investors. But I, I really like that what you're saying. You can take an entrepreneurial approach there, apply it to your business. And basically, that's where we started with Elon Musk, right? What you were saying. I mean, you peel it off and you understand how the business works and you tackle that one instead of, okay, let's go for another round and wait what happens. I, I, that is a very, very good one. Very nice. And um, I wanted to add two books, but they're more related to uh, Noam Wasserman. Noam Wasserman is now on the, on the West Coast as well in L.A., I used to work with him in the, at Harvard, at Harvard Business School, but he has really, really, really good advice of uh, startup teams and the dynamics within teams where things go wrong. And at, I would say at a more um, fundamental level, there is Napoleon Hill, think and grow rich, because there you get to the principles and beliefs of yourself as a CEO, to the uh, beliefs and, and principles uh, you know, as a team. And sometimes they're very Dutch and thinking small. And then you come to you guys in San Francisco or, you know, every, anywhere in California and Boston. And it's how do you think big? And Napoleon Hill, it's an old book, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that's basically giving you all these principles. So, uh, so that might be another uh, interesting one. Um, Yes, we are. Oh, I can't believe it. We're almost getting to uh, the end of the session uh, already. Um, so, um, Wiebe, Eva, do you still have some, uh, some lessons or three lessons for, for the CEOs listening or maybe to uh, the audience is broader, maybe some people who are building up ecosystems uh, in the Netherlands for startup companies? Do you have... Any advice, maybe? Well, one of my favorite lessons that we, because uh, we started with Elon Musk and the big names in the lessons. So we, under, one of our other lessons is um, make decisions like Jeff Bezos. Um, and it, it goes to his, his theory of one and two door decisions. So he says, there's two types of decisions, right? The one, first is, think of it as, as a door. You go through the door and you can't go back. So you have to be really sure that you want to go through that door because if you don't like it, there's no way back. Uh, that's a type one decision or a, a one door, one way, well, one door decision. Um, and those kinds of decisions, you need to ask for some help. You need to uh, really think about it, uh, plan a meeting, go pros and cons. But by far the most decisions are actually two door. So you can go through the door and if you don't like it, you can just go back. And those kinds of decisions you need to take fast. You don't need to talk about it forever. You don't need to, uh, you know, have every layer of the organization have their say because you can go back if it doesn't work out. Um, and by far the most decisions you'll take are those kinds of decisions. And 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 it helps you this increase speed in your organization. And if you just go ahead and and, and take those decisions uh, on your own or, or in a small team. Um, so that's an important lesson that I really like and that I think can help. Uh, a risk averse country like the net or culture like the Dutch culture to take the decisions more proactively and, and keep going. Um, and then finally, I think I 
for my for myself the main part of the the main reason for writing book was to inspire people to take more risks so really if and obviously we're talking uh to entrepreneurs here so they they're known to they're a bit better with it than most Dutch people but um just if you have this really burning desire for something still be careful and think about how you're going to handle things but take the plunge do it and see see how far you get um that's what i did when i moved here and it's it's worked out very well for me so um that's what i really hope to inspire with the book too yeah um, <laughs> the one of the one of the lessons we 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 uh, um pointed out was was networking um it goes uh to and lots of people are not comfortable with with networking but you really have to learn it uh there's there's no other way um and um you don't have to be an extrovert um it, it's all based on integrity and understanding a couple of fundamental rules uh that's the uh that you can't just trample on um you know, most most communication here is is uh, answered within twenty four hours uh, here, so it's uh, it tends to go a little bit faster than in uh, most other cultures. Um, but yeah, like Ava said, whether you work for a government, whether you work for university or a hospital or a startup, there's ways to get to get uh, to get by with techniques from Silicon Valley, where you ask your boss if you have a very risk averse boss, you could ask. Um, I need a little bit of leeway. Um, give me a little bit longer leash because I have this idea. I know you disagree with it, but I want to prove that I can hit this milestone in three months. And then through this two door, I can come back. And if we can go back to the drawing board and a lot of, not a lot, but there are startups that are actually celebrating failures. I think it's a, it's an absolutely brilliant concept where you say, Hey, not, you don't need a bloody polder model and everybody around the table to agree. You just agree to disagree for those first three months, you give them a little bit of longer leash, you give them a little bit of budget. And, you know, it's not that their neck, their head is on the line. So you don't have to chop their head off after three months, but you have a learning experience and say, okay, you know, we tried it, it didn't work. But that's, that's how you, at least in, in very, um, you know, all these clay levels in, in bureaucracies, how you can work through that. Um, and then while still respecting a polder model. Um, so th I think those are brilliant techniques from, from Silicon Valley that I hadn't learned outside of the Valley. Um, you know, and then and networking, you know, go out there, meet people. One of the things I noticed that the startups and the, uh, the ecosystem uh, need, to, need, need to be centralized. They need to be centralized in places like the Netherlands. And Eindhoven is not talking to Groningen. Um, a startup in Helmond is not even talking to a startup in Eindhoven, even if they're in the same field. So, so the exchange of, of ideas and, and the, fear, the fear of sharing um, confidential data is, is outrageous. It just always boggles my mind. I just don't understand it because the risk of failure is so high when you run a startup that sharing, sh the risk of sharing and somebody copying you, you know, unless, unless you have uh, not filed for the patent or, uh, uh, right? I mean, some, some, some uh, extreme cases, but in general, just getting the help and, and risking that you get uh, important feedback is, is much more beneficial um, than, than keeping it to yourself. Um, like we said, most, in most cases, the, the hurdle of the product is, is, not, is not the main hurdle anymore. Um, you're going to be competing on distribution. And guess what? If you want to, you know, we, we talked about that wood. We talked about IP. If you think your IP is so bloody valuable, guess what? Somebody who raises uh, $20 million in Boston and starts five years later than you did, um, they're going to kick your ass because they, uh, they have way more money. Their product might not be as good as yours, but they'll, their market share will be 10 times yours in, in a couple of years just because they got the funding and because they were open to learning uh, about those and, and building that network. So it's, it's, it's rarely even in... in in highly uh, scientific, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of professors um, uh, starting startups, and and I've seen that mistake being made over and over again. Uh, so that's that's a, uh, yeah, it's it's obviously you, you're from the academic world yourself. I think it's uh, it's fair to say that when you come from the academic world, you're guarding your your paper right before you publish it. It's it's very um, you have to be, you have to be very protective because that's your livelihood. 
But what we learn in Silicon Valley is it's almost the opposite. If you don't share your idea and get the feedback required to go to market, it actually hampers your, your, your uh, opportunities. So it's almost the opposite. Can I add to that, Vibe, maybe you would like to elaborate on that one as well, because I think it's a very important lesson. It's, you call it pay it forward. I call it give us gain. Um, and that combined with networking, that can help companies a lot, I think. But you, you, you put it in your book, so I would love, love to hear what you think of it, uh, how, you, how it works for you. In one minute, because we're rounding off in two. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's, maybe it's very Dutch. <laughs> But well, time, but... yeah, pay, I mean, pay it forward is 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 really um, helping the ecosystem. You know, you don't expect anything in return. Writing a book uh, doesn't uh, unless you, you sell hundreds of thousands of copies is not going to get generate any money. This is really we we like to accelerate ecosystems like the Netherlands and others around the world. Um, we're very excited about the feedback we've been uh, uh, receiving so far, uh, not just from the Netherlands, from other places as well. And it's been great to work with with Ava. Uh, on this and get her perspective and get that interaction. Um, so that's, yeah, it's it was an evening and weekend project for us, for us writing the book in, in 10 weeks. We're proud of our, oh, wow. uh, we're proud of what we accomplished. And uh, yeah, again, uh, great, great thanks because I could not have done this without Ava. She's been brilliant. So. Well, guys, you know, you, you, you've you done an amazing job um, putting that all, I, I didn't even know about the 10 weeks, but uh, putting it all together, um, giving us a perspective on the business culture of the United States, a couple of takeaways, um, but there's much more in the book uh, to read and, and to really take home uh, and learn as, uh, as, you know, getting rid of blind spots. But some takeaways are start your Delaware. Networking is super important. Make sure you get people on board in the United States with skin in the game instead of, you know, one time uh, meetings with, with, with people. And um, I like the growth hacking strategy. And I, I, it's like a take home message to think about what is your growth hacking strategy, peel it off. I, that, that was very intriguing what you, what you all shared with us. So, you know, we can continue talking about it. Um, we are fortunate, uh, the GSP program, the Global Skill Up program, uh, to continue talking uh, with uh, each year. We bring 12 companies already for years. And I know there are a lot of people in this call as well who have been GSP companies, but also a lot of people who've been, who are super uh, helpful, uh, long-term structurally being helpful uh, with us, uh, making those companies big. Uh, people like Hank Hanselaar, who was, was on, who was on the phone in, in uh, San Diego, and a lot of other people as well. Um, we, with GSP program, we hope to be back, and I'm a total optimist, so we will be back in fall with 12 companies in California uh, to help them scale up. And uh, Diva, I want to thank you. You you will be uh, you are an advisory board member of GSP, and we are together. And I also want to mention the ecoms consulates in in San Francisco for organizing, of course, also uh, the last event in uh, November. People in LA, people in San Diego, Orange County. We're all here uh, for the people who who are triggered now. Uh, by starting up the Delaware company and coming over. We're there if it comes to life sciences companies. Vibe is, of course, uh, somebody uh, who, who knows a lot about the tech uh, world as well. But there are lots of people here who want to make you big. So uh, if you dare to do it, there are enough people to, to help you grow. So thank you all for the people in Holland uh, for spending the time with us tonight. Um, the people in, in California, it's, uh, it's just uh, the break of day. You can still do a lot today and uh, make your companies big. Uh, thank you very much, Wiebe and Eva, for your uh, very, very inspiring talk and your very inspiring book. And we're looking forward to continue this conversation. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.